Yeah, it was, uh, it was a really, I think, productive discussion. Um, and I should say anyone who was there, just jump in or throw a tomato if I say something wrong, um, which I certainly might. Um, so although it wasn't initially supposed to be focused on this, we ended up spending a lot of time talking about this data platform that was uh, uh, sort of introduced and discussed yesterday. Um, and I'm not certainly gonna go through the colors of the boxes and what it all does, because we've done that before. Um, but really what we focused our discussion around was really two things. One was sort of what does it mean to openly share data and sort of wrestling with some of the consequences of that. That was kind of topic number one. And topic number two was really about kind of exploration and consumption and visualization of the data and what kinds of things do we need to provide um, as a community to make this as, as valuable and useful as possible to all, uh, both computational people but also biologists. Um, so on the topic of, of sharing, what a lot of the discussion revolved around was trying to get clarity and about what openness really means um, when we talk about open sharing. And uh, that's something that I think this community, you know, we don't, we imagine building through this data platform and through the Cell Atlas an open resource. Um, and that means a resource that anyone can get access to. So it is, you know, data is fully consented and made available openly to everybody. Um, and that also means the, the, the platform itself is open to anyone to contribute data to. So, you know, with, there will be certain basic stipulations and caveats about data conforming to the right standards of both file integrity and metadata, semantics and syntax, um, as well as, of course, consent. But beyond that, the, the system is open to anyone. So I think we all love that as a principle and feel really committed to it as a principle. And a lot of our discussion was sort of wrestling with, you know, are there concerns we have about uh, uh, what the consequences of that might be. And you know, we heard sort of really, I think, powerful examples and, and, and things we really need to think about. Uh, people saying things like, well, this platform, I submit my data to it, I haven't published on it. Um, and then someone who works in the same area that I do, uh, look at what I put into the platform and goes and does their own work and then publishes a paper that uses what I did um, and I don't get any credit for it. So I think one response to that you know, would be to, well, okay, maybe this whole openness thing, we should, you know, walk back and it's not a good idea and we just should go back to the way things were done before. Uh, I think that's not, I think we all agree that's not the way to do it. Uh, we wanna push forward and, and really try to lead uh, in this community by example and really show what, what open sharing means. There are also great example projects in other fields like physics, but also um, within genomics, things like a thousand genomes project was discussed as an example of something where open sharing all during the project was a really core tenant of the project. Um, so really where we landed was we, we want to be open and we want to move this community towards openness uh, and open sharing, but we have to think about and, and sort of you know, deal with these, these concerns that people have and sort of build in, in, in appropriate mechanisms. Um, so some of those things we thought about uh, potentially trying to do, um, one idea, and these were not things we settled in an hour, but things to be thinking about, I think, uh, maybe at future conferences, future workshops. Um, one was the idea of a code of conduct. Um, so, you know, even if we, we have a platform where anyone can submit and anyone can get access, there should be certain sort of rules of engagement and agreements. Like, if you put data into this thing, um, you shouldn't go find someone else's data and write a paper about it and take credit for it. There has to be certain sort of standards we as a community either implicitly or explicitly agree to when we're all in this sort of world of, of open sharing and sharing our data very publicly and very quickly, uh, especially before publication. Um, there was a discussion that we certainly didn't feel, feel uh, ready to, to make any sort of commitments about um, around a publication strategy or many publication strategies for the project as a whole. So I think that's something for the, the HDA consortium and organizing committee and really the whole community to be thinking about. Um, so the topic came up, we didn't certainly decide anything, um, but there were some really interesting thoughts about at what point and in what form do we publish on the work that we've done? Are we imagining where individual, a world where individual data sets are sort of act as publications? Maybe that's a great way to think about it. Um, and, and I think there's some really interesting things to be done here. And also cool examples where things like BioArchive are really shifting the model of publication in general. And maybe we can sort of tap into that and, and, and leverage that as well. Um, talked about the need for influencers. You know, we talked about how BioArchive to some extent gained a lot of popularity because well-known scientists started putting their papers there months before they published in Nature. And that's a great example. And, and hopefully we as a community can again be sort of both, we both need influencers and can be the influencers. 
Um, we need incentives if people are going to be sharing early and often. They want to, you know, we should make sure the platform gives them really cool functionality, things like running uh, analyses, standard analyses that require a lot of computation for free. That's a cool incentive, hopefully. Um, and then also, uh, th there should be a way for people to find who they want to collaborate with. Um, you know, if you're about to put your data into this thing, and you want to find out if there's another lab who's doing similar work that already has put data in, and you should be collaborating, then we should make it easy for you to find those connections and make those connections. So just during the session, we created a new Slack channel, hashtag collaborations, um, that uh, hopefully is a place where people can go to discuss and find people they might want to collaborate with, um, and the link to that is there. The, uh, the second half was really about uh, once we have all this openly available data, how do we consume it? And how do we make sure we have tools for data consumption that uh, really meet the needs of biologists, um, ultimately? Both, you know, I think we, there was a concern expressed that if all the people involved in building this come from a more computational biology perspective, we might build something that's great for the computational scientists, but is not as useful for sort of downstream users that are coming up from sort of pure or less computational perspective. Um, so I think it's super important to be thinking about that. Uh, here, what we did was really just raise a handful of dichotomies um, that were kind of interesting to explore. So for example, the difference between providing a visualization versus providing an API. You know, there's one thing to go to a website where you get to browse the data in a cool way. Um, that sort of serves one use case. There's also having things like APIs that let people build new tools on top of those sort, those sort of resources for data, and that's another really important thing to explore, and that we want to find a way to balance these two. Um, and ideally, as much as possible, not sort of reinvent the wheel. So we don't probably need eight sort of TSNI in the, in the web browser uh, implementations, um, but we might need more than one. So trying to figure out how to get communities talking together um, and doing this more collaboratively. Um, we talked about the value of computing in the cloud, um, but also the value in doing, doing analysis locally. Um, and that I think these are two important use cases was sort of the, the agreement of the group. Um, you know, in terms of a, a, one of the really cool things and exciting things I think about this idea for this platform is that the data are made available in multiple cloud environments and, and that democratizes access in that you don't need to download the whole data set to work with it. You can bring your own compute and run compute in the cloud right alongside the data set. Um, and that's really powerful and really democratizing. At the same time, there are people that maybe feel more comfortable just grabbing a very small subset of the data that's particular to their problem area or their tissue type or whatever, and then downloading it and working with it locally. So again, I think it was really important to work through these two use cases, and we ultimately want to, to uh, provide both of them. Um, and then also uh, this dichotomy of sort of exploratory analysis versus standard analysis. And I think the consensus here was that this is an evolving picture. You know, right now we have some whether for sequencing or imaging, we have some notion of certain kind of parts of an analysis pipeline that are super standard and necessary for anyone to work with the data, things like alignment um, or maybe sort of base cell segmentation, maybe. Um, and then there are other things that are more exploratory, more high level, um, and that I think we basically felt this is not a hard dichotomy that the, it's gonna evolve what, uh, which, what falls on which side, and we need to be open to that. And there will things that might start off as exploratory and end up becoming more standardized, and we can sort of figure that out as it evolves. Um, and the, the action items here where we landed was, was basically we need to all be committed, anyone involved in building this or anyone in the community building tools to understand the use cases um, and to constantly be in contact with anyone who's gonna use the tool, whether it's a computational person or a, bio or a, a biologist. Um, and then there's also needs to be a commitment to documentation Again, at a technical level, if we have APIs, they need to be documented. But we also should have uh, really nice, easy to read explanations of these tools and how, and how people use them. Um, and with respect to this topic, uh, there is also a channel on Slack um, called Tertiary Portals. And there is not yet a weekly meeting for this uh, topic, but there will be really soon. Um, and these weekly meetings we've been doing for the data platform are open to literally everyone. Um, as Tim put it, I think, if we had 200 people on the Google Hangout, that would be a good problem. Um, and we'll figure out how to handle a virtual meeting with 200 people. Um, so basically, reach out to us on Slack or, or otherwise um, and jump into this channel if you want to join this discussion. Um, and we really want as many people with as many use cases as possible to get the conversation started early about how to make this tool useful. Yeah, I just want to point out for this. We need a Slack microphone, channel. maybe. For this Slack channel, I want, I want to point out that I'm really excited about these meetings when they start to happen, so I'm definitely going to be there. And I, 
remember that if you're interested in making portals or you do make portals and you think you have something really cool or you're someone who wants to use them, all those people are very important. So it's not just for people who are making portals and, and want to find out what are the standards going to be and, you know, and how can we work together. It's also, you know, be greedy. Like, this is what I want. Make this for me. Come, come there and say that. You know, we want to be able to hear that too. Uh, so it's open really to everyone that's interested in visualizing and working with your data and just getting people to do work for you. So. <laughs> okay. There's one question behind it, yeah. <clears throat> just a question to make sure I understand the, the purpose. So the Slack.com website, this is mainly to share tools and talk about like uh, technical development or also analysis and as analysis results as it's ongoing? So is the, the website is the main purpose to share tools and discussion for tool development or also analysis and uh, like more biological interpretation of the data? Well, there was a, some, a part of us that, uh, more involving the biological uh, aspect that also hope that uh, we can involve the community making a list uh, of important analysis or way to browse all the, all, all the cells, or way to, to put a 2D, 3D and uh, zoom in, zoom out, uh, and make queries. And I think that, that, that we need uh, to implement a wish list of uh, and, uh, essential, uh, essential wish, li <laughs> wish list also from the biological user that are not necessarily fluent in, 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 in bioinformatics and computational biology. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I think the answer is it's for both. Um, so it's both sort of tool developers um, and possibly people who are developing similar tools that want to work together, but it's also for people that just want to have a tool and sort of dream up mm -hmm. the kind of thing that would be useful and then to articulate what that would be. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, for these meetings, there's no yes or no for any of that. It's the, the, what are the kinds of things that need to be developed and this should be grown from the community. We shouldn't imagine what's needed. We should see what is needed. And if you're some, a developer who does methodology and you want to make it available, you, know, you should be thinking about you know, how to make it available. And this might be a mechanism for that. Mm -hmm. So it's for people who are making methods. If, if there's a way to make an app store that shares all the you know, methods, maybe that's a portal. These are lots and lots and lots of different websites that try to um, serve niche needs, whatever they might be, or gen genericized needs. So it's, it's a, a, a big diversity. OK, I think, yeah. More from biologist. Is there any <laughs> biologist who needs some something okay. more specific for the you know for for their data analysis that maybe was not in the room or? So, are there any plans to post or integrate this data with in non biological cases? So, people who are just overall like data explorers and like to download random data sets and try machine learning algorithms on them and learn about them. Um, are there any plans? in the maybe farther future to, um, to integrate with, say, DAT and other projects like that? I, I think that's an awesome idea. Um, you know, I've taken a lot of inspiration from things uh, the Allen Institute has done, for example, in, in building you know, not just really cool data resources, but really fun websites where anyone can sort of go to and learn and explore. I think that'd be awesome to build on top of this, and it is totally uh, in scope. Come to, the, come to the weekly meeting, and let's talk about it. So you were talking about um, the whole challenge of open access, early publication, and rules. But by the definition, this thing is open access for everyone. So I'm actually less worried about anyone in this environment, because this community really seems to be building as something very good. But it's going to be open to anyone that hasn't had any participation in this meeting. So how are you going to enforce those um, list of behaviors when it's completely open within and outside the consortium, in your view. Yeah, I, I certainly don't want to speak, speak for everyone. I think uh, really the answer is that this is something we as a community should figure out. Um, I think something like a, a code of conduct is a, I mean, that, that idea, if formalized, could start to provide an answer um, that, you know, really like we, this community, this room, could work out what we think the norms and sort of rules of engagement should be, and then we just make those super clear for anyone putting data in. That's sort of what they have to conform to. Anthony? 
Yeah, I was going to say, I think the code of conduct is incredibly important. So uh, in the US, the Precision Medicine Initiative is also seeking to be very sort of open in its um, posture and enable citizen scientists. And I think a standard of a well thought out code of conduct, um, and then anyone who violates it, there are suitable punishments that range from expulsion from the garden to maybe things that are more um, name and shame kind of things. But I think it's very enforceable. Eric. Comments from the experience? Uh, what experience? Yeah, so uh, this arose um, uh, after the, the main human genome project, um, which was totally, totally open. Anybody could compete, including Solera, could download and compete and all that. Um, when we got to the next bit of making different organisms, gathering other data, um, it, people were uncomfortable that folks might scoop them on things, and that led to the Fort Lauderdale principles after a meeting in Fort Lauderdale, because uh, it was the successor to the Bermuda Principles, so named because that's where that meeting was. And the Fort Lauderdale Principles included the fact that if somebody was making a large amount of data available, you weren't going to scoop them on it, but the, the provider of the data did put a time limit on how long they were going to take to publish it, and after that time limit, it was open season. So part of code of principles, a code of conduct, it's much easier if the code of conduct is attached to, this expires on this date. And people were free to analyze data in advance of that, just not publish before the, the date. Um, anything, you know, that made it much simpler to understand what, what a responsible user was supposed to do. That's, that, I think, yeah, whatever, learning from, from past examples is super important. Um, maybe we need the Stockholm principles. Um, I don't know, we're out of time, but maybe, uh, when's the next meeting? Yeah.